Happy Sabbath, Hamilton Church. I guess it's church family now. I have been singing here for about a year now, and I am blessed to be able to serve in a different capacity, which is standing up here. Singing is different, different than speaking. I don't know if you guys know that. But um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm excited to, to share what I have to share, and I'm privileged to stand up here. We want to welcome our online viewers. I don't know which one they're going to be in. Um, I know some people will be tuning in online to, to view my sermon, which I feel very supported and loved by. So welcome to our online viewers. And we are just so thankful that you are here, and we're thankful that you guys are here in person as well. Hamilton Community wants you to be here, want you to feel loved and welcome. And so I get the privilege to share with you a very special and specific part of my life, one that I am going through right now. And I think that's a really cool idea of a sermon because as I share what I'm going through right in this moment, I know that as I give this sermon, God will show me things throughout. And so, as a friend of mine once said, the first step in writing a sermon is that the sermon must preach to you first. And I find that very much with my sermons. I pray that it'll bless you as well, my words, but hopefully as well, this sermon will be a guide that I can go back on as I go through this transition, as I go through this journey, as I go through this in-between that I'm in. And the sermon is called In the In-Between. And it is called that because I am a new graduate of Southern Adventist University with a BS in mass communication, emphasis in media production. I work at It Is Written in the area. And so I am transitioning into being a full-on adult with a job, and just in these past four short months. So that's a good cut yourself some slack. Lexi, reminder, I have to remind myself, it's only been four short months. I, <laughs> I could have never imagined what this transition would have felt like. One, because it's different for each person, but also because growing up as a pastor's kid, I started to really dislike change. I, I love my friendships. I love people. I love being able to connect. I love being able to to understand them, and as we all know, as we grow older, our, our connections with people become more meaningful because we understand our feelings more, we understand our emotions more. So each time I've had to say goodbye, it has been the hardest thing. And you know, if you were to ask me, Lexi, what is the hardest thing for you to do? I would say it is to say goodbye. And so the best way I've found to describe this in-between, this period that I'm going through is fog. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for this day, for the blessing of your love, for your care, for who you are, for all that you embody. I pray that all of that shines through me. Let me be an example of you. Um, even if I am to just bless one person with this message, that's all that matters. Most importantly, hide me behind your cross and the gift of its salvation and the hope that it brings. Most importantly, help Satan to be nowhere near this building. Lord, bless us now as we receive this message, as I give this message. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> fog. I have felt like I've been in a fog and still kind of feel that way in these past four months. So with fog, I'm, I'm just above the ground, but I'm also not in the sky. I haven't hit rock bottom or anything, but I'm also not on a high. On a high, not high. Just wanted to clarify, you know, highs, of highs and lows of life. Just wanted, to <laughs> just wanted to get that one out there. And so throughout this experience, God has given me and shown me so many cool things as he normally does throughout every experience in our lives, especially when we look for them, including aspects like water vapor and Domino's cheesy bread. But I'm going to talk about that later. That's the cliffhanger for you. If you guys didn't see a movie this week, there's your cliffhanger. Sometimes I wonder why I even question the phases of my life that I'm in. I just, I, I find it funny. Because why, 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 why would you question your life if you're not struggling? You know what I mean? Like, why, 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 why do I do this? And I can, just, I can just picture the angels up in heaven just, you know, watching down below, watching all these stories, all your stories play out. And they look down and they see mine, and they're like, wait a minute, hold up. This girl, she's asking for trials? She's not even struggling. 
This isn't even like a Job scenario. Like, I'm not even, like, I'm, I'm not a, I don't think I'm a perfect follower of God either. Like, I'm not even struggling. And they're like, why is she asking for trials? And then I can just picture my guardian angel looking up at them. I don't know what to tell you, man. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> don't ask me why my uh, guardian angel has a Jersey-type accent. You know, I just thought it would fit. I don't know. But why, why am I questioning when I'm not struggling? Or kind of. Why do I feel so lonely even though there are still a lot of good people around me? Why is letting go the hardest it's ever been? And especially letting go of things that I, I never thought, I didn't realize that I needed to let go of. And why does this transition, having a full-time job, finding a routine, almost too much time to think, and still struggling to fit God into it all, why does it feel like fog that's covering everything around me? There's the verse. Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. In Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, we find the story of Abram. Abram, Abram was a nobody. He wasn't even a Jew. And I find it funny because you, you, you go through Genesis and you, Genesis 13, or even before, like Genesis 10, Genesis 12, and it, you know, talks about the story of the, the Tower of Babel. They're building this tower and the mix of languages, and then it just goes to the genealogy of Shem to Abram, and then it literally goes, the call of Abram. It's like... You go from something, there's no, there's, no, there's no context behind it. And obviously, what do we all do when we find the books and the, the parts in the Bible where it just goes to the genealogy? We, we skip it because it's, I don't, I don't know, the significance to it. And chapter 12, it just goes, God goes straight into it. He says, the Lord said to Abram, go. And it was funny trying to find more context to Abram's story, but I was like, all right, well, God made it plain and simple. He said, go. And I've noticed that God does this in the Bible very often to the most, to the, the, the most prominent and, and biggest characters in the Bible. He just tells them to go. He just gives them plainly. He doesn't give a preface. He doesn't even really tell them what they're going what to what do. He just he tells them to go. The Lord says to Abram, go. In other translations I've read, it says, leave your country. That one verse is just a little part of this huge and insane promise that God has bestowed upon Abram, and that's just the first part of it. We haven't even got to the promise yet, technically. So I see that God has called me to leave my country, to go and leave my country. And in actual terms, God has called me to leave school and all that it has brought the whole past 15 years of my life that I've spent in school. And if you're following along in the beginning, before we started talking about Abram, you would have noticed that I stated three different questions. One that had to do with loneliness. One, and the second one, that has to do with, with letting go. And the third, with transition. Those all go hand in hand with the overarching theme of loneliness that has been the biggest factor within my in-between. And it's really cool to see how they all weave together within all those three different aspects. They all weave together and they come together to make this in between. Well, we'll start with school and letting go. So for most of my life, I have struggled with school. I've just struggled to focus, to sit still and just to, like focus on what I'm doing, even as a kid. Um, I was always the oldest in my class. My parents put me in a few years later, and this is not a diss to my parents, I am more than grateful they did this because I feel as though if I were to go in an earlier age, it would have been even more stressful, I would have felt more insecure, just wouldn't have been a happy experience. And my sister, school came super easy to her, so I would compare, and for a while, I started to believe that I was, for a better choice of words, dumb. I know it's a strong word, but that's what I believed. And so as I'm going through, and you know, it's all just general studies, so I'm not finding anything I'm passionate in, then I come to college. And who would have thought that I would struggle with letting go of college? But in college, not only did I enjoy the community I found, but I found classes that I actually enjoyed. 
and that I could be passionate about. I, I, wanted to, I actually wanted to go not just to see the people, but to learn and to read the books and to do the hands-on things, to do the media production. And so I wanted to share that little snippet of my life because I think that it's important that when we let go and we go into a new season of our lives, it's important to look back and to reflect and to be aware of maybe the unhealthy relationship that I did have with school for a long time. But then I can look back at that experience and I can truly say as I walk down that aisle with my cap and gown that God helped me cultivate a truly happy relationship with school as I said goodbye to it. But the biggest, going back to letting go, the biggest and hardest thing about letting go of the past of my country, of leaving my country, was the community that I could so easily find every single day. And it's not that I still don't, it's not that I don't have a strong community around me. I have my new Hamilton Community Church family. I have alumni in the area, some that have come to support me today. I have my family that I can like call and stuff, but it's, you know, it's, it's not the same. It was so easy to, to walk with a friend down the promenade, to go to the VM, to walk to class with them, to, walk, to go to their village apartment. It was easy and spontaneous to do different activities because they were all there, ease and comfort. But now, everyone, it's the summer. Everyone's went home, they've moved to a different state, they've gotten a new job. Some of my friends are actually going overseas as missionaries, which I think is incredible and a, an amazing opportunity to serve God. But I've, I've had to say so many goodbyes. Some that I won't see for years. I live in the area still. I work a nine to five job at the moment. I will be full time in August. I'll come back and I'll be full time in August. I get up in the morning, I go to work, and then I come back home and I sleep. And I know a lot of you that have been working for a long time are saying, boy, does she not know what's gonna happen after that. <laughs> she doesn't know what's coming for her. But that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm, it's, over and over. And everyone has different schedules, so it just seems harder to get together. And so I've always been an initiator in my friendships. And I think that that comes, and I think I know that it comes from the fact that I just love people. I'm always thinking about when we can hang out next, and when we connect, connect more and understand, and I can better listen to them. Speaking of listen, I, even though we're in the beginning of the sermon, I want to challenge you guys to do something for me. And I'm going to challenge you to look at, the, look at the parts of your life and the different aspects of it and to look at how you listen. How you listen to others, how you actively listen. And I want to challenge you to see if you can grow, and, grow from it, to pray about it, see if God will show you more. Because my, the end of my freshman year of college, I realized that I wasn't the greatest listener. It wasn't that I didn't want to hear what they had to say, but I, I, I had to interrupt because I, I felt like I had something that you know, was going to help and was going to contribute to the conversation. But I realized there was one moment where God just told me within this conversation, he said, hey, just listen, and I will give you the words to say next if it's important. And so I can truly say that, that was life-changing for me to just to sit and listen and trust God that he will give me what to say. And it seems silly. It's like conversation is easy, Lexi, like this, I'm just talking to people. No, it's important to listen and to listen actively because that person will feel heard. And like I said, life-changing. So I challenge you. Pray about it. See how you can listen better. Keeping you guys to that. I see all your faces. If I see you again, I ask you about it. <laughs> and so... Being so social, it's funny because I look back at my childhood. My mom used to always call me a social butterfly, and I guess it still kind of stands today. But unfortunately, being so social has its downfalls. And my love for people and friendships has led me to a dependence on those friendships. And most importantly, for my value and affirmation. Which, first of all, that is unfair to put the expectation on your friends. One, because they're human, and they're going to make mistakes just like you. And also, they're not always going to know what you need and what you are feeling in that moment. And they could even be struggling with things aside from that. So there's so many factors that go into that. And so I'm over here starting to put my dependence on them for my value and affirmation. Spoiler, the one person, the only person that knows me and knows everything about me, who made me, that's the person that I wasn't putting my value and affirmation in. And he, he's always known what I needed. He's always cared, and that's God, of course. 
And so this dependence, it started to lead me to, to be jealous, to compare, and most importantly, to physically feel anxiety. I'd feel like a pit in my stomach, kind of like butterflies, but not. <laughs> and that, that was a turning point for me. I decided to go, this was last November, that I started to realize this full dependence, this physical anxiety, I decided to go to counseling. And I went to counseling, and the counselor sat with me and listened to me and heard what I had to say. She didn't know my story, so she had no judgment or bias coming into the situation. And it was a godsend. That was truly another life-changing moment in my life. And a little, a little story within that, as I'm going through this experience and I'm struggling to not compare and not be jealous and not put my dependence and my affirmation and my value on, on my friends, I get to a point halfway through where I just, I just want to give up. I'm, I've started to believe the lies that I've been telling myself and that Satan has been telling me for so long that it's just become overwhelming. You know, there's school, there's stresses. I live with people, so I don't want to burden them either with what I'm going through. And I'm almost, the main thing, I was mad at myself for struggling with friendships, for struggling with this, because why, this shouldn't be a, this, you shouldn't struggle with this, Lexi, that's what I told myself. And so I go to my counselor after Christmas break, and I sit with her, and I tell her what I'm going through, and at this point, I'm giving up. I don't, I don't know what else to do. And she tells me these words that I'll never forget. She says, I'm so proud of you for not giving up. And then less than a day later, two days later, my roommate, who's also been part of this process very closely, she says the same exact words. I'm so proud of you for not giving up. And I remember choking up in that moment because I was like, what are you saying? I feel like, I, what are you saying I haven't given up? Like, I, I literally told myself that I was going to give up. And I realized that it's because God hadn't given up on me. And I'm so thankful that I didn't give up either, but it was only, <laughs> it was only through him that I didn't give up. And I'm so thankful for that experience because it's brought me to now. And just a quick plug for counseling. I, and this is my personal belief, I think that everyone should try it at least once. It is, like I said, a beautiful thing to sit with someone who doesn't know your story, they don't have any judgment or bias, and them just to listen to you. They've gone to school for this. Like, they're a professional, so they can hear you. If you don't like it, that's okay. But I think, I think it's something we should all try. And most importantly, even if you're not really struggling, because the first time I actually went to counseling, I, wasn't, I, told, I told myself that I wasn't struggling, and I technically wasn't. But just to have someone sit there and say, hey, I'm here, and I hear you. I challenge you guys if that, if that is something. So as I look at that experience, I am so thankful for it. I can say that now, man. I could not say that during the experience. And many times during that experience, I'm so glad God didn't give up, but I really felt like he should. But I'm thankful again because it has led me to now where I am stronger, where I direct my value, or I'm slowly bringing it back, my value, my affirmation to God more than I ever did before. But I have still a ways to go. But that all being said, I come to this point in my life and I go through all of that, and God says, hey, now you're better equipped to leave your country. I am better equipped to go and leave my country. But, of course, we are humans, and it's easy to revert back to what we know and to what's comfortable, even if it's not good. So with this more time to think and this in-between and just working, I reverted back a little bit to my dependence on my friendships. And so whenever we hang out, whenever they give me affirmations, whenever they would, you know, they would reach out and they would initiate, I would feel happy and loved. But then when they didn't, then I must not be really happy or loved or valued. Obviously, that is not true. But that is how I felt. But what does God say that he will do right after he tells Abram to go and leave your country and your family and go to the land that I will show you? What does he say, church? Oh, I just went over it. He says, it will be great. 
I will make you great, God says. I will make you great and I will bless you. After you step out in faith and even though it's hard and even though you're still struggling with things you struggled with a year ago, I will make you great and I will bless you. I will make you feel happy and valued. And the most important part is not that God, not only does God promise us a blessing after we choose to follow him, but it's only when we step out in faith, that's when he gives us the blessing. We have free will. And it's cool. God, sometimes we don't even have to ask for this. God, with Abram, he said, go. And Abram said, I'm going to do it. And then God said, this is, what, this is what's going to happen. It was, just a, it was just like a super quick, just... But God still has so much more to give us if we would but ask, if we would step out in faith. And so, like I said in the beginning, it's actually kind of quite comical because I resent change. Yeah, one of those, a change resenter. But... God says in the Bible right here, just what we just read, the more that I step out and change happens, however big or small, God has new ways to bless me and make me great, to make me into a great nation. Now, I don't know what that entails. Does that mean having more than two children, which is what I, all that I can feel like I can bear? I don't know what the great nation looks like. But... Whatever it is, it will be great. I'd like to think, and I don't think, I know, that God's version of great best for us, for you, for me, so much, so much bigger than we could ever imagine. It's so much bigger, and it's nowhere near the dictionary says, this is what great means. This is what blessed means. So, Let's finish reading the rest of verse 2 and of 3. I want you guys to turn there with me. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And that's the end of that promise. And if, if that wasn't already great enough and amazing enough and insane. In chapter 15, God gives Abram more context to what that means, which I just think just blows my mind. Like, we have such little faith in these huge promises that God throws in our faces. But yet he's like, you know what? I'm still going to give you more context. God says in chapter 15, he says, he, he took him outside. He took Abram outside and he said, look up at the sky. He says, and count the stars. And I know that God was joking here because then he says, indeed, if you can count them. And then obviously we can't count on the stars. Indeed, if you can count them, he says, so shall your offspring be. Like this huge promise. Then your offspring shall be like the stars of the sky. And I've read somewhere else, like the sand of the sea, like the grains of sand. Abram was a nobody. And God promised him this promise if he would only step out and go and leave his country. And there's a verse right before that where God affirms Abram. And I wish that I had read this verse a little sooner in my journey, but I'm thankful that I have found it now. The verse says, it's the first verse of chapter 15, it says, Abram, do not be afraid. I am your shield, your very great reward. So God is our shield. This is my Captain America pose. I don't think it's very good, but you guys do? No? Okay. God's going to be our shield and our very great reward. You know how you get a reward when you're a kid, like in class, like with a star or something? No, God says he is our reward and our shield. That's... And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remember that. I'm going to go back to that verse when I struggle, because I know I will as I keep going through this transition. God has so much to give us if we would but ask. There's so much more that God wants to give us if we would but ask. I remember my first few months in the place that I live at now. And two of my girlfriends, they wanted to watch a episode of a TV show together. And I was like, oh, yo, come to my crib. Like, this is my new spot. Like, they love to have people over. This is going to be great. We're going to all hang out. 
And so they come, and they have a decent-sized TV in their living room. And so I was like, well, let's check it out. Like, but then I realized, oh, I don't think this has internet on it you know, or a streaming service. I don't know if this will work. And so I was like, well, I do have my laptop. <laughs> and they're like, OK. And I was like, OK, we're going to settle for this. That's OK. Like, it'll still be fun. And so we're about a few minutes into the episode, and Carol, the wife, comes in, and she has none of that. She says, why aren't you guys watching on the TV screen? I was, and then we go with the whole process of telling her, you know, streaming service, like, I don't think it'll connect to the TV. And she goes, oh, you, what about the TV? She's like, what about the TV downstairs that we have? I think that has a streaming service on it, like Roku or whatever. I, my, I had to, like, close my mouth when she... I didn't even know this home, I'd been there only a few months, I didn't even know this home had a third floor, let alone a whole like TV room. And I'm gonna give them a little flex, they're not here, so they won't get mad at me. This is an awesome TV room. This is a huge flat screen TV. There's like an entertainment center around there. There's a closet with games. There's a super comfy couch, so comfy, people sleep on it. And there's pillows and there's, and there's blankets and it's just so comfortable. And we were gonna settle for my little computer screen. We were gonna sit there like this. And so we're watching, and I'm just, I know God was speaking to you in that moment, and they were just like, they were having a grand time, but I was like, you know, in my deep moment, being dramatic maybe, but I think it's a cool, it's a cool thing. And so we're sitting there, and we're watching the episode, and then Carol, she comes down again, and she brings this little tray with hot chocolate, with popcorn, not popcorn from the bag, she freshly popped this popcorn, and then she brought these cute little theater, movie theater style popcorn containers to put your popcorn in. And I was flabbergasted. I love using big words that make sense in the situation, and this is one of them. I was flabbergasted. And again, I'm a dramatic person, so maybe this story sounds dramatic to you, but it was such a crazy like, analogy that God gave, me to, God gave me in that moment because I was going to settle for this little computer screen. And in literal terms, I often do settle for a little screen because social media does exist. But when I, when we settle, when I settle for what I know, it's okay. It's, it's meh. Actually, sometimes it's not really that great and I don't really want to do it again. But when I let go and I go to a new place and I ask God to help me, he will give me what I need and so much more with popcorn and hot chocolate and cute little movie theater style containers left over. So today, tomorrow, and for every day to come, hopefully in this journey, I'm choosing to let go, to leave the past 15 years of my life, to leave it behind, to leave my family and live in a new place. I'm stepping out in faith and being alone for the first time in my life. But here's the best part and the coolest thing that I think I figured out from this sermon. As a friend of mine, they described to me, as I was telling them what I was gonna talk about my first sermon, they was like, huh, they're like, so you're feeling lonely. They're like, maybe, maybe being alone is just another way to be with God. Maybe being alone is just another reason, another push for me to find peace with God, to find contentment with Him, Oh, God does this to me all the time where I just, I do things and he's like, oh, gotcha, you've been actually, it's ironic because contentment with God, I've literally been praying for that since high school, that exact wording. I would pray, God, I pray that I am simply content with you. I'm not going to raise my voice any higher because I think my voice is the same level in high school. It's even if there's a hundred people around me, God, or that don't like me, or there's not anyone at all around me, Help me to be content with just you. In high school, I prayed this prayer. And I struggled to, and I still do sometimes, to be alone with God. And the main reason for that was because I couldn't physically feel him. He wasn't, wasn't physically there standing in front of me. How many of you have struggled with the physical aspect of God? And if not, that's okay. But if you have, it's, it's hard. It's difficult because I can't give God a hug. I can't hold his hand. So that prayer has been ringing in my ears during this whole in-between period because God has been saying, hey, 
I know you're feeling lonely, but you've been telling me for years that you want to find contentment with me. And now there's, there's no craziness or busyness or stress of school or random activities to drown me out. It's just you and me, God tells me. It's just you and me. Of course, he's right, always. But it's, ugh, it's hard to admit that I let school drown him out, that I let the busyness and craziness of life drown him out. And it's even harder to admit that now that I have more time, that I still have let whatever may distract me drown him out. Not that I wanted it to happen, but it happens. And so as I struggled to find, to be intentional, to find contentment with him, I remembered something that I should do every single day that I struggle and every time I struggle, which is look at the life of Jesus. Jesus, as he always does, goes against the grain and does the opposite of what the world has taught us to think and, with, and the opposite of what we tell ourselves what the enemy tells us, the lies, the insecurities. And if you remember anything from this sermon, I hope that you remember this. Jesus used loneliness. It'll come up. Oh, well. Jesus used loneliness to his advantage. He would literally, here we go, he would literally take time to go and be alone. Like he would, he would on purpose. You know, I, 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 it's been hard for me to be alone. But Jesus would take time to be alone so he could hear his father's voice. And when he would go to be alone with God, you better plant your feet, put your Crocs in sport mode, because Jesus would come back like a storm. When he would go away, we've read in the Bible, Jesus would come back and perform the most incredible miracles that the world has ever seen, that have ever been written about. He would walk away from all the noises, from the Pharisees jeering in his ears. For me, the world, the world standards telling me things or the lies that Satan tells me leading to me to believe my insecurities, leading me to believe that I am not enough. Jesus would walk away and be in nature. And in the peaceful silence that it would bring, the only thing that he could hear alone out there by himself was God's voice. Amen? God's voice telling him that telling me that I am good enough, that the world is wrong, and that God's standards are the complete opposite. Amen? That Satan's lies, that Satan's lies are exactly that. Lies. Nothing else. They're lies. Why do I feel alone? Even though there are still good and supportive people around me. I think, I think that is something that I will always struggle with because I am such a social person and God has given me a gift to connect with people, but when I feel alone, I will strive to use it as advantage and see it as God did, as Jesus did when he was on earth. See it as more time with God. More time to believe the promises he wants to give me, which will lead me to more value and affirmation in him, leading me again to feel truly happy and valued by him. You are truly happy when you, you believe the words that God has to say to you. You are truly valued by God. And more time, more time again, to make me realize, to, to show me that I am never truly alone. Amen. Wait a minute. I think the fog is starting to clear. Remember that fog I talked about? And everyone knows what happens when the fog clears. Everything feels crisp and pristine. You can, everything almost seems like prettier. I think, I'm, I think I'm starting to see that fog clear. And here's the cool thing about fog, about water vapor that I mentioned in the beginning, those two cool aspects. So I'm going to be a little scientific-y right now, but I looked it up online, so it's not actually even my words, National Geographic. And this is the only time you're going to see me be scientific-y, so 
hear me. Fog shows up when water vapor, so fog shows up when water vapor or water in its gas form condenses. And so during that condensation, molecules of water vapor combine to make tiny little liquid droplets that hang in the air. And that's the fog. You can see the fog because of those liquid droplets. Water vapor, though, that condenses when fog shows up is a gas. But it's invisible. Water vapor is a gas, but it's invisible. Satan is a gas, a bad smelling one, if I might add to. But water vapor, Satan, a gas, that is invisible. So even though the fog may be surrounding all I see, it's confusing, difficult, and it's uh, honestly just annoying. There was a gas before that fog that was covering all that I see. You following me? But I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't see that gas. I couldn't see that God was working through even before I was in my in-between. He was shielding me. He was, he was making that gas, Satan, and his lies invisible. It's cool. God's in everything. I mean, he made nature, but, you know, he's in everything. And I, I didn't even know about I didn't even know about them. I didn't even know about that, those, the gas, the other problems, what Satan was doing behind the scenes. And I'm over here complaining about the fog that I'm going through. But... Don't get me wrong, my feelings about the fog that I was going through are valid and real, and it's important that when you have these feelings that you are aware of them, you try to understand them, and even sit with them for a while, be sad for a little bit, it's okay, but the most important step of the process when you're struggling, the most important step for me was that I didn't dwell on that fog, didn't let it keep me there, because... There's more beyond the fog, a bigger and clearer and more pristine view. When that fog clears, it's a view that I can never imagine, one that God is waiting to show me, one that God is waiting to show you. I know you're wondering, Lexi, don't end yet. What about the Domino's cheesy bread? Picture with me. Oh, here it comes. I made this myself. Picture with me. I'm sitting on a porch, it's a beautiful evening, the sun is setting, the weather is lovely, and best of all, I am eating Domino's cheesy bread. And if you haven't had it, your future is not looking bright. It's, it's a perfect evening, but ironically, I am crying, and crying is okay. It's okay to cry, but it is sad, because why, why are you crying? It's a perfect evening, Lexi. And let me, just, let me just clarify, no one has ever cried eating Domino's cheesy bread unless they're crying tears of joy from its cheesy goodness. Please try it sometime this week. But I, I was crying, and this is a beautiful and powerful moment, I was crying because I was finally letting go and giving up something that I didn't realize that I needed to. And also, it was a huge part and a step in my process of letting go. And God gave me this analogy right in that moment as I was letting go. So picture with me, you are a child again. And if you are a child, stay the way you are. Picture with me, you are a child again, and this is your toy. Oh, it's a truck. And this toy, I know it's not broken. I mean, I guess it could be. But picture this toy being broken, or it's just not working super well, and you need God to fix it. So you go up to God, and you say, God, I need you to fix this for me. Please help me. God looks down lovingly, and he says, Child, I can fix this for you. I will take this for you. I can and I will. Toy still in your hand. And I'm like, God, it's just, uh, it's just so hard to let go. Like, and it's not that I don't want you to fix it. But you're still holding the train, the toy, the broken toy in your hand. You have free will. God's not going to take it from you unless you give it to him. He stays there waiting patiently and smiling at you lovingly. You're still holding the toy. And you may loosen your grip. I may loosen my grip a little bit, but that toy is still in my hands. Now, back to my cheesy bread crying on the porch story. When I finally let go, at least to the best of my ability of what I was going through, I felt peace. 
weight lifted off my shoulders, and I was like, whoa. So I not, I, I not only let go of my toy, my situation that I was going through, but I, 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 gave, I gave that situation to the only person in the whole entire world who can fix it, the person who died, so I could live and so he could still fix my problems and show me hope and a solution. And this is the best part. When I let go and that toy is removed from my hands, I can then receive the embrace of my father. The most warm and loving hug. One that I believe that I will truly feel someday. When we let go, not only are we giving God what we've been struggling with, but we can turn and embrace him. And he can take us with him. We can walk together and he can show you the next thing that you're going to go to even more beautiful and pristine than you've ever seen before. Verse 4. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. Another translation said, So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed. After this big promise, Abram went as the Lord had instructed. But Abram didn't leave empty-handed. Abram left with a promise. So Lexi departed as the Lord had instructed. Had instructed. Lexi departed, but she didn't leave without a promise. She didn't leave empty-handed. God has a promise for you, and he won't leave you empty-handed. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are so good, so great, and I am so incredibly thankful for the love and the care that you have for me, for all that you do. Thank you for showing this to me. I pray that I will look back on it and I will understand more of your character and your love. And I pray that everyone in this room, maybe even just one, was blessed by this and that hopefully they can take something from it. But most importantly, hopefully that they can just see another beautiful picture, another beautiful example of the love you have for us and all that you want to show us, even when the fog is covering all that we see. We love you so much. Thank you for letting me be a vessel now. In Jesus' name, amen. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, You can be confident of one thing, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day Jesus Christ returns. Here at Hamilton, we exist to connect the disconnected by sharing Jesus through loving and serving and being a grace-filled church family. When you walk through our doors, we want you to feel right at home. It's our intention to make worship attractive and Christ irresistible. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, welcome to Children's Church. Good morning, welcome to Hamilton. Our service is about to start. Come join us now, it's time to worship. 